second uh, guest for today. He's a serial social entrepreneur. He's deeply involved in designing and incubating of social enterprises based on cooperative principles and charitable causes. He is an IRMA graduate. Uh, his company is Access Livelihoods, which is a group in Hyderabad based on social enterprises that work with marginalized communities to reimagine their livelihoods. It was established in 2005. Uh, it is also a Nithi Aayog recognized established incubation center. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for helping me to be here and to also reflect on my own work in these few days by listening to many people who have done some great work, uh, people who have uh, spoken here, have done very inspirational work. And uh, that actually helps people like us uh, who have at least another three decades to go to work in the ground. Uh, uh, to reflect and keep improvising the work that we have been doing. So I thank uh, everybody in the organizing committee for having given me this opportunity. The, uh, and I was having listened to uh, Prasanna and uh, everybody here who spoke. I was uh, wondering what should I be speaking about. Then I spoke with few people what I should be speaking about. And then I chose to focus on two things, uh, which probably has not got so much of uh, importance in the last few days. And uh, it's also the area where I have been working for so long time. So, uh, and uh, I'm sure many would also be working. We'll focus on these two things. First is the self-transformation. Uh, I feel that before we talk about non-violent economy, innovations, our institutional architecture, the journey is truly starting with your own internal transformation. If we do not do start this journey, which is around inner transformation, there is nothing that we can create as non-violent economy in the external world. So I start with that, and I will try and talk about three points which are very key that I have undergone as a transformation in the last two decades. And uh, uh, tough journey for me. I don't think I've really reached to this uh, status of what is required in ideality for a non-violent economy, but uh, somewhere I am on the pathway to achieve that particular thing. So for non-violence economy, and uh, this word was introduced by Jill and Rajagopalji when they came to our organization in February 2022, and I started exploring Violent economy. I didn't read, but I was trying to explore myself what is non-violent economy mean. And slowly, what dawned on to me is this is an economy which is not based on competition. It is not based on comparisons. It is not based on greed. It is not based on exploitation. It is not based on uh, uh, extraction. It is not based on accumulation. So it has to be an economy which is different from these fundamental basis things. So it has to be an economy which is based on collaboration, cooperation. It has to be an economy where you care, you share, you give. And this is the kind of an economy that we are trying to talk when we talk about non-violent economy. We are also talking about distributive justice. And yesterday also Mr. Vijay Mahajan was talking about distributive justice as a key element in the D, in the GDP. So that is the basis for non-violent economy. And for this kind of an economy to shape up, there are three things that I feel everybody has to transform themselves before we talk about expecting the system to be economic, non-violent economic system. The first is, uh, I will call as recognizing beauty. So how do you recognize beauty? And to me, the seeds of this thought on what is beauty came in uh, a CBSE student in Kendri Vidyalaya. So there, in Kendri Vidyalaya, and uh, there uh, there used to be a poem written by a famous uh, 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 you know poet called uh, Nizam Ezekiel. He's also an environmentalist, and he had written a poem called Beauty. And in Beauty, he mentions one line saying that there is a beauty in the way lizard hunts for a cockroach and eats it. It's our ability or inability to see that beauty. Right? So in everything in the world, 
if we are able to accept nature as it is then there is a beauty so uh, this is a key transition that is required because i feel that when we paint people as competitive exploitative uh, you know violent and uh, this one we somehow are not able to collaborate with them we are not being empathetic with these people and the vinoba bhave ji through the bhudan movement has clearly shown that while we may want to keep the landlords and everybody away but if you start working with them there could be a change that can be established through this kind of spirit and this one so when we look at what vinoba bhave ji has done as a gandhian and he was considered to be the first acharya for the following the gandhi philosophy so we see that that kind of a transition has to happen and it is a, a very tough change so to me the change was like i would enjoy eating sweets i would enjoy eating spicy food but i was not so happy to eat bitter things so not even a chocolate not a coffee or any of these things so my first transition was start appreciating bitterness so how do i train myself to start eating bitter god everything in a mild proportions so this is the first transition that is that if i have to become non violent i have to accept nature violence exploitation as it is and yet still be able to work with it so this is what is the first step and i found it very tough because uh, when we go to the ground and we work with women and we see that there are traders everywhere who work with the women whose terms of engagement are quite different from the terms of engagement which we would like to be which is not fairer but the reality is these are the people who have been providing services to the women for quite long time and how do i see that i don't really engage in a fight with them but i have to be slowly able to collaborate with them or cooperate with them and see a transition where women get the space to do their own work so uh, this is the, the most important thing the moment i was going with an anger the approach towards these traders was different but in my own practice when i started seeing the traders as also human beings that if i spend start spending our time and talk about this greater purpose where distributive justice is important i realized that there are a lot of collaborators from within the traders who are ready to work with us so this is a huge transition and i took some time to make this transition the second transition that i wanted was that uh, gandhi has explained this very clearly that is you have to structure your life based on needs right as an youngster uh, it's very easy to get carried away by desires and wants and uh, therefore i also had lot of desires maybe the desire to have a big job the desire to have study in some of the best institutes the desire to have all the facilities like probably having a house having a car and all those things but at some point around 24 to 25 i realized that if my choices were these then probably i will not be able to uh do what i want to do which is to work with women and help them to set up their own enterprises which means i had a choice that my structure of life has to change what is the change that i have to do i have to start working on accepting the fact that i require only seven shirts i require only two pairs of footwear i require only i don't need to buy a house i it can wait it will come on my own time but i can be staying in a rented house i can be in a particular this one so these were the kind of changes which was to move away from desires to come to a part part of wants uh, from wants to a life of structure again i wouldn't say that i have transitioned it fully but i have made a big difference i have only two pairs today i have live with only seven shirts and few pants i am happy to stay in a rented house i am able to negotiate and tell my parents and my all my cousins who are all in us and everywhere that i also am able to lead a life which is happy without staying in a rented house so all of this is a huge transition and i say this is important because again i'll start with this that when we work with communities it is not possible that i have a lifestyle where i have 
uh, house and everything, which means that I start with a liability. In finance language, we call it as liability. I have to be an asset to the community. I can't be a liability to the community. So if I had started with my life saying that, oh, I want a one crore for my house and 30 lakhs for my you know, savings and uh, a car of 10 lakhs, if this was my, this one, I can never go into it is because the communities cannot afford to pay me too much. So the way we have started is to start with a limited salary, 20,000, 30,000, what can take care of your needs. And because I was comfortable with that kind of a situation, I could do whatever I do in the last two decades in this one. So this was a huge trans second transition. And I feel that for non-violent economy, we have to set limits on our own desires. We have to live by needs. If once we are able to live by needs, we can then actually create a non-violent economy in the world. So this is the uh, second transition that arrived in. And the third important transition is to believe in abundance. Again, the moment we see that we are not abundant in our life, then we have this need to hide things. So there is need for patenting. There is need for you know trying to derive maximum money from everything that we do. So there is a need for uh, you know uh, accumulate a lot of assets because in the name that we don't know what will happen to our children, what will happen to our family. Therefore, I, today I need to save. So when there is need for all of this, instead of believing that nature has its own way to take care of all these things, I don't need to be insecure. I don't need to be fearful. If I have don't come out from this fear and uh, uh, insecurity that I have. I can't believe in abundance. And abundance is important because only when we believe abundance, then we can actually share, then we can give, then we can not be, we need not actually fight for patents. We need not be non-collaborative. We can cooperate, we can share, and we can give. So this is a very critical insight that we got, I got over a period of time. And this was again an important transition that I did. So these are the three transitions that I want to leave, uh, just state that if you want non-violent economy, the change has to begin at ourselves and it has to start with focusing on needs, structuring our life around needs. Second, it is important that we believe in abundance. Third, we accept nature as it is. That means there will be violence, there will be non-violence. We do not need to adopt or no violence, but we do not need to hate violence. So we need to see a mechanism to work with this. Having said this particular part, the first element of self-transformation, I will now focus on the work that I have done in the last two decades. The work that we have done to promote cooperatives and collectives. Cooperatives and collectives, I feel, are a significant element of the non-violent economy because it is a mechanism where people come together in a very respectable, decent way to figure out solutions for their own livelihoods. So by definition, I don't know how many of you know what is cooperative, but by definition, cooperative is a entity which where people voluntarily come it is governed in a democratic way where people articulate their needs and focus on their needs. They do not come together for the need of profit, but they come together because they have a need for services. So this is the key difference. A normal enterprise, a company, is driven by capital, as Mr. Vijay Mahajan had suggested. We need to, of course, learn and embrace capital. Capital is important. I'm not saying that capital is not important, but it should not be the sole driver for whatever entrepreneurial activity that you do. So that is the reason we believe that there is a decent way in which we can collaborate with women. That is by becoming allowing them to be a partner rather than being a beneficiary Right? Typically, if you are giving, you are a benefactor. You have an upper hand, like the way you give you know, arms to a, uh, a destitute. Your hand is always on the higher side, and the receiver is always under the dime. So in, to some extent, in an economy where you are only giving, and uh, donations are the primary way in which you go, I feel that we are also affecting the dignity of the people. While giving is good for an individual who is giving it, but if it is given with an ego, it has an hindrance towards dignity of the individual. That is the reason we believe that cooperatives are the only way to work with women, because it neither sees the woman as a beneficiary, 
neither actually sees them as a competitor but it sees it in a way of partner or a collaborator and it helps us to work with the community in an on equal footing so that is how we got into cooperatives and last two decades have been journey working with cooperatives of the women in various locations though our first attempt was to make a dairy cooperative today for uh, the all the blessings and support from everybody it is a very successful cooperative which has 21000 women part of it it has its own brand called swakrishi it does a business of around 120 crores the brand is owned by women and when i started out from the institute of rural management this was one one of my dream is to create a brand for women because after 75 years we still feel that women do not have their own brand there is no i have identity in the market space an identity which can give them respect dignity and also the sufficient income so swakrishi the first attempt to create a dairy was beautifully done in and the organization cooperative development foundation where i used to work actually helped us to be the uh, a team which was really successful and we could work with the women the The beauty of this particular thing is when we design institutions because getting back to what is the theme that the theme is innovations and institutions for the uh, non violent movement so the beauty of this design is we used to collect milk within 25 kilometers of radius and sell within 100 kilometers of radius so when we talk about supply chains supply chains have to be environmentally conscious and it has to be driven by the local economy which means that my markets have to be nearby and my production centers have to also be nearby the way we design it even a large organization like heritage or uh, uh, any other you know uh, private dairy cannot penetrate us because our collection cost is just hardly 1 rupee a liter a private player collects from thousands of kilometers collect converts that into products and sells in the urban market their cost of collection is around 3 rupees their cost of marketing is around 5 rupees and therefore obviously the milk will be at much higher price whereas what we have done is we have optimized the supply chain got it into 25 kilometers sold it in 100 kilometers the brand is owned by the women and 80% or 85% of what the women uh, consumer pays goes back to the women in their this one therefore the women are able to get two times three times higher income so this is the kind of a model i was lucky to be a part of a organization which was very matured and therefore the guidance helped me to achieve whatever has to be done as a project head in that particular project subsequently based on this particular success we established access livelihoods and then we started thinking about how do we organize women in different sectors so we got into agriculture we got into weaving we got into pastoral communities who rear uh, sheep goat we also got into uh, tribal communities where the dependency is on forestry and forest produce and in all of these uh, i would say our work in agriculture is still work in progress there are a lot of things that we have to learn because transition into ag uh, agroecological based production system organic system itself is a discovery for me as i said first the discovery has to be for me before i can actually has the women to work on these ideas so that transition has taken some time so uh, and it is taking time and it may take another 3 4 years before we actually reach to a model in agriculture but i will share about like i shared about the dairy i will also share about the weaving experience that we had so in uh, samitha is here and she is behind uh, the all the designs including the Uh, cloth that i'm wearing it is designed by her uh, and their team so the weaving experiment that we were trying to do was to work with women help the viewers again to transition into this one where the inputs are completely in the weaver's hand which means that uh, while we have yarn we also create a yarn bank for the women we create adequate working capital for the women to work around 
which means that they will have to borrow, but they have to borrow it in a very limited way. It is not about borrowing 10 rupees when you have 1 rupee, but you have to borrow 3 rupees, which is manageable when you have 1 rupee, which means that savings become a very critical instrument. So what we said to women is you invest into this particular, and we're talking about women who are probably getting only 50,000 rupees per annum as income. To these women, our appeal was to start upfront investing 1,000 rupees. And unless we are able to convince this, because this is a very critical impairment, that the person who wants the change has to keep contributing to the process of change. If they are passive receivers, they are not going to really make any change. They have to be active contributors to the process, which means that they have to contribute share capital. Not only that they contribute share capital, but they also regularly save with which we call as transaction deposits. The deposits that every wage that I get, I save 5% or 10% of that money to buy new shares within the enterprise. This way, both in the dairy cooperative, where we could mobilize around 8 crores from the same woman who are drawing 50,000 rupees. How did it happen, 8 crores? Simple mathematics, 20,000 women, even if they share, save 5,000 rupees, it's 10 crores. Right? So all we need is 5,000. And if the woman can save only 100 rupees every month, that is 1,200 rupees in a year. And in five years, you have the 5,000, which is eight crores, which is required for the woman to do the business, which is a big business of 120 crores. We said the same thing with the weavers. And in this particular case, with just a few people, Today we have around 2 crores of savings. They do a business of around 4.5 crores, 5 crores. They make a profit of around 18%. Of the consumer rupee, again 75 to 80% goes back to the communities and they actually are able to improve their incomes. Now for this to happen again, as Mr. Vijay Mahajan had told, that, and as non like economy says, we can't hate capital, we cannot hate technology, but we cannot ha hate any of these things, but we have to embrace all of this, which means that for technology to be adopted, we used open source software to create probably first of its kind of a thing where complete yarn to the end consumer is traced through an ERP solution, which is homegrown and home built as a software. Now this gives stability to the production system. This kind of an institutional system, which has technology fully adopted, where you can monitor the designs of weavers producing uh, clothes at the grassroots level sitting in Hyderabad, where we can exchange ideas with the communities, where today we have uh, even community members who have been working with us over a period of time have picked up you know, uh, online meetings, Zoom calls, and they sit and work with us, sitting in their own villages, work with us on these Zoom calls and all those things. So there is an embracement for technology. There is also an openness to take debt. And we have taken, a, uh, I must say that we lost the balance and therefore we took a debt of around 50, 60 crores. Today, we have repaid around 43 crores. And there is still struggle because in some of our units, there is a struggle to repay this money. So we are facing that kind of a situation. But we go back to our basics. The basics is communities have to invest. They have to borrow in a limited way. And with that, they should run an enterprise. So this is what we have done in weaving sector by embracing technology, by creating new designs, by not saying that uh, we will not adopt the new mechanisms. We have created an e-commerce site for the women. They manage these e-commerce site. And uh, all these things we have done for the women to do it. We did a similar effort with the pastoral community. Again, we worked with an organization, great organization called Sajivan. Sajivan gave us this opportunity to work with 50 women in Surendra where goat rarers came together, those who are pastoralists, they, I hope you know pastoral community, they walk for 100 kilometers, 200 kilometers across the, uh, the roads. They are a useful ecological uh, service providers, I would say, ecological service providers because they are responsibility to carry the diversity, they carry the manure, 
to different locations and the fodder is uh, all which is in the open grazing land is used by these people to grow the goats so when we saw that meat and other uh, opportunities were coming down and especially in Gujarat there is no meat industry that is as big as this one. So we work with this community to work on goat milk. There is a great thing about uh, you know milk in uh, this one. Uh, you can tell me the time. Is it there or? Uh, for five minutes? Five minutes, okay. I'll wind it up. So, uh, uh, so, so the goat community started collecting the milk. And then we said that, again, we looked at technology. I am myself a dairy technology, food technologist. So we work with few people who understood goat milk very well. And we created cheese out of the goat milk. So we set up a small unit where 50 uh, pastoral community uh, women own through their own shares a company. And in this company, we create cheese from the goat milk. Again, they directly sell online and multiple ways. This is a cheese which is well appreciated. The value realization is much higher. It comes to almost 1,000 rupees or 1,200 rupees. Again, there is a dilemma here. In all our pricing, we have a dilemma. And when we look at it from non-violent economy, we can't have a super premium pricing, right? While we want our communities to gain wealth, we are also not trying to exploit the consumers, which means that we have to be very careful in the way we price. Unfortunately, in the cheese, we could still not achieve because market is selling at 2,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees, the goat milk cheese. And still we priced it at 1,000 rupees. We are almost one third the price of this. But we still feel that it is a, no, a very premium kind of a pricing, which means the consumer is actually at having to pay a very high amount. Unlike the weaving and other places where we have been able to solve the pricing riddle for a non-violent economy, we haven't been able to solve the pricing riddle within the cheese, uh, where we can't really come down to 400 rupees or 300 rupees just because it doesn't cost that much. The women are very happy because they are getting 1,000 rupees for the same amount of, uh, for every uh, cheese, uh, 10 liters of milk, we get one, lit one kg of cheese. And that one particular uh, one kg of cheese today is selling at 1,000 rupees a kg. So for these communities, we build this one. Now, for all of these to happen, I've been saying big numbers, money to come, this one. The institutional back behind it is a very complex thing because government of India, as uh, Mr. Sridhar has told, regulates this very well. Our intent is non-violent. Uh, non Our intent is also to help the communities to get wealth. But if you do business in not-for-profit, Today, you will lose your tax exemption certificates. Therefore, we ended up having a complex be uh, architecture behind. We have three companies, which are for-profit entities, working with three not-for-profits. A not-for-profit which works for agriculture, a not-for-profit which works for weaving, a not-for-profit which works on training and educating women so that they can manage their own operations. So these are the three not-for-profits. Again, this is necessary because education is regulated separately. Now, uh, work with the weaving and the uh, agriculture, although they are in the similar lines, it's difficult to understand. So the structures have to be different. And for the for-profit, for when we look at financing, financing is regulated by RBA. And it, the only way you can actually get money is through a non-banking financing company structure, which means it has to be a private limited company. And then there is marketing services which we have to give to the women. Women will not directly come into the market, this one. In fact, the way we started was we used to carry loads of you know, handloom cloth on our uh, shoulders and go and sell in different places initially. Now there are teams who are working on the same thing. So initially, you have to give the support to the women so that they understand how to organize exhibitions, how to do the market, which means that you have to soil your hands, you have to do the marketing yourself. So. For marketing to happen, we have created another company. So we have three for-profits, three not-for-profits. But how do we actually not ensure that our for-profits also turn up exploitative? They don't become this one. So for that, we have created a value architecture. One is, we don't invite investors who expect huge returns. So the first thing that we say is the investor has to sign 
uh, agreement and take a vote saying that they were happy to get 7 to 8%, which is a bank's fixed deposit return. Because the rest of the surplus has to go back to the community. So only those investors are invited. Growth will be slow. We will not become Baiju's. We will not become uh, Zomato. But we should be happy for the fact that there will be few investors who will be ready to come and take this at that particular level. So we take money only from those kind of investors. There are enough such kind of people. We have been able to raise around 5 crores with this kind of a capital, which is getting only 7% return. And with that, we started doing the business. The another key thing is, we have told our employees when they join, that a lot of people used to ask me, why don't you give competitive salaries as that you get in the corporate world? We said, this is not what for we are here. Of course, we want everybody to have a decent living. You yourself cannot live in penury to help others, right? Uh, if you feel that it is penury, there are people who become very comfortable with normal living with needs, but many who don't uh, become comfortable, including me, as I do this transition, that for them there is a decent level of living. So what we have said is that India's top 10 percent, or the 90 percent of India, is able to live with around 70 to 80 thousand rupees in their hand per month. So this is the kind of praise that we give, which is that we get a maximum salary that anybody can draw in our organization, which is around one and a half lakh. And beyond that, nobody can draw anything. So you have to start working with this. So this is an again a vow that every employee who joins the organization takes, saying that of course we require some facilities, but we will be happy to live with this kind of a return, not with a return where we have CEO salaries which are hundred times more than the, uh, you know, uh, bottom line professional. This is not the kind. So we set a benchmark saying that only 12 times higher than the lowest paid individual has to be the benchmark in the uh, organization. So within that ratio, we operate. So this is the kind of systems that we have developed to ensure that for-profits really don't only work for capital, but they work for communities. The economy becomes non-violent and cooperatives and collectives are able to flourish. We have been uh, lucky enough that many of our work on the ground is doing really well. It is not that we didn't have this one, uh, failures. There have been failures. Communities sometimes have seen us with doubts, but over a period of time they recognize the value of doing good work. And there is, when you connect with people with a heart which is very clean, and when in this one, people start receiving you in a very much different way, in a very embracing way. And we have been lucky to have such kind of communities where we haven't had such kind of opportunities. Then the question here is, I have to go into my own self and figure out why this has happened. And wherever I've uh, looked at it, I've seen that I've done a mistake in the way we have designed the enterprises. And we're trying to correct this. Once recently, the same diary where we have created two, three successful models. We created a diary in Pune where because startup power was involved, we thought that we could jump with the investment where community invested only 20 lakhs and we brought in almost 8 lakhs. This has collapsed. The diary has collapsed. So we are reformulating it because we made a fundamental error in the way we have designed it where we said that 1 rupee should be from the community and 3 rupees should be from the external world. That equation was violated, thinking that Tata Power is with us and we will be able to do it. But we are trying to be part of So there have been failures, but we are both uh, standing clear that we work towards non-violent economy, where we first transform ourselves and then transform the external world. And second, we work on a model which is based on cooperatives, collaboration, and trying work. At the same time, we embrace technology, we don't hate it. We also embrace capital, but we can't embrace capital without our things and work around with things. Thank you.